How would you describe the art of Kombo Chafika? Mm. Lively, energetic, multidisciplinary, um, varied, experimental. I think that's, that's the start. Like I work in multiple different media from yeah. traditional stuff all the way to experimental, digital, interactive stuff. So I think what ties it all together is kind of curiosity, whether it's like seeing drawings and be like, how is that done? To seeing uh, augmented reality things and be like, how is that done? It's kind of the same impulse. It's yeah. just at a different stage in my life in terms of what's accessible. I hear uh, that. In terms of like that. visual, like the, the aesthetics of it. I like things with energy. I like things with like multiple layers to them. So when you first see it at a glance, there's something there. The bright colors, vibrancy, the comp composition, but then if you take more time and like, you know, do a little bit of investigating, there's also like um, some symbolism and things that can reward like the deeper viewing. So that's kind of what I try to go for. Yeah, so. I love that, man. Um, and when and how did you discover that you like had a passion for, for art? Like first as, maybe not as, is it consuming? As a consumer and then as like a creator? Yeah, so I mean, I've been doing art since I was like five, just literally just drawing before I even knew it was art. Yeah. You see, so it's kind of like, uh, I think my first best friend, all we did was just like draw with pens in our school books and like play, you know, Nintendo Mario, you know, that was literally like, like my first thing was just that, it was just art like that since. And then over the years, I think in high school, started getting into like a bit more painting. I had a cousin that was into graphic design, he was using Corel Draw, and then I was like curious about it, what is this? I think it was Corel Designer, like the one yeah. that's more like Illustrator. So for me, it's, it's been like a lifelong thing. And then as I'm exposed to different things, the curiosity would take me in different directions, whether that was design using Photoshop and Illustrator, and then animation, and then the digital stuff that's more code-based, which is more recent. But yeah, to, to stick to the question, this, it started literally hanging out. Quiet kids want to do something, they just like draw it, you know? Yeah, so that, that's fair how enough. It started for me. Fair enough. And so that's interesting because you're like multidisciplinary, man, like animator, um, art, the, the abstract art, like fine art, um, video production. Like you do a lot of things, uh, right? How do you. How do you learn like all these things? Because yeah, it's a lot like mm. being good at visual effects, like that's a career in and of itself, right? Uh, being yeah. good at like art direction, design, branding, all of these could be like one like job, right? But you yeah. do like all of them. How do you go about learning? I mean, okay, how do I learn? Yeah. Um, firstly, I like learning. That's the first thing. You have to actually enjoy learning. Like, uh, I think a lot, a lot of stuff goes back to uh, like childhood. Like I really enjoyed um, not just art class, but even math class, English class. I just like learning in general. So I think that's the, that's the start of it. I've got to give some thanks to um, some of my teachers when I was young who taught me how to learn basically, taught me how to like, how to look for the good sources for reliable information before I start trying to learn and go, okay, this is a good source and then yeah. dive in there. I studied economics in uni. Um, my, everything I've learned technically in terms of using software has been off the internet and I was able to like pretty early on by getting advice from other people that had studied this stuff formally be directed to good sources for information. So going to like the very start would be like After Effects. I got a lot of advice from, well, tutorials watching like Andrew Kramer back in the day. That was like yeah. number one source and immediately I was like, okay. You can literally learn After Effects if you follow like this one channel. And I take a similar mindset to these other apps like Blender. It's like, you know, you could pretty much learn Blender if you just follow Blender Guru or in a couple others. Yeah. So YouTube University for a lot of the stuff because it's all available for free. It takes a bit of curiosity to go into it. But I do see how some people need to be learning with other people. 
Yeah, like an institution thing, like an institution yeah. thing? an institution, but also just people to bounce ideas off of. And when you run into trouble, to have someone to like ask about it, because it can get a little bit confusing trying to find, when you, when you hit trouble, trying yeah. to find a solution for that. Oh, that one setting <laughs> that you have that's messing it all up, you know. Those, those forums can be confusing, I get it. And it is easier when others are doing the same thing, people that you know in person. Yeah. So that's what these sort of like workshop things are good for. And institutions are good for that. But I think the best thing about institution is having other people to, to collaborate with in the program with you. It's almost like uh, you're really team building without really trying because you're just there together in yeah. your classroom, you know. Yeah, and you don't have to like go to someone and be like, I'll have to like pay you for your skills. It's like yeah. you kind of have a common goal most of the time. You're there, your homies, <laughs> you're all in the same box. So it's not like there's uh, that client. Uh, yeah, the client <laughs> it's thing. not like a transaction. No, you it doesn't feel like transactional. It's trying to learn something. So that's, I think that's the main thing that's still a benefit from taking uh, organized classes and going to school for stuff. Yeah. It's having peers to like collaborate with because the information is available out there already. Yeah, fair enough. I hear that, man. And so you, you touched on uh, studying economics. You did that in USA, Georgia, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what do you think you were exposed to, like in the US, right? Um, that's now reflected in your work that you might not have gotten if you had been like in Zim throughout? Because, yeah, I always hear people talk about exposure, the value of exposure, and I'm mm. always curious about that. Mm. I don't think I would have gone as eagerly into the digital side because I was really drawing and painting and I was somewhat curious, but I think like uh, the animation stuff, I was curious about it. Yeah. And seeing, I was fortunate enough to have a friend that worked at Cartoon Network. My very first ever job, like straight out of uni, let me take a step back, was like web design, literally like front end web design at, uh, I think it was called LBI, it's like a big, like ad agency, yeah, HTML and CSS. And then it started getting more hectic with like some PHP stuff. When I was in uni, I'd been doing like flyers and sites for like my friends' bands. I was fortunate to know a lot of musicians at the time. And then as I started getting into the weeds of like web coding, I was like, eh, 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 eh this is getting too <laughs> much. Too much. <laughs> and there was a guy who worked at this agency. He had a nice corner office with like a view. He always had like incense candles burning. Yeah. And I was like, what's that guy doing? And literally all he did, maybe he did more, but as far as I could tell, all he did was like these animated intros to these websites. So I was like, okay, I need to learn how to do that. I need yeah. to learn After Effects. This, this looks like so dope. <laughs> because this coding stuff is getting too intense. And then I taught myself After Effects and my friend, a good friend of mine, Leah, was working at Adult Swim and was like, hey, you should apply for this editing job. So I went there, did the interview and they gave me like a flash stick like some eight gig flash stick with a bunch of images, some video, some audio, and they're like, make it as funny as you can, you've got one week. Yeah. So I did it, I handed it back, didn't get the job. But then I think three months later, they had like a visual effects gig, and I was also just better now, because I had some idea of like, this is what, you know, typically you guys have to put stuff together. And I got the same, same sort of situation, went to an interview in person, got a flash stick, put something together, made it like nutty, and got that gig. So I think now you're seeing how I've gone from like web design to like After Effects and yeah. then some of the coding that I was running away from is now helping me a lot now when I'm doing this um, interactive stuff or even in After Effects sometimes you have to put code in there. Yeah. So I think uh, as much as I ran away from the web de development stuff it was good for like my code tolerance because you know some people you, you show them like a computer with code Yeah. I'm kind of like one of they those people. Are, they're just like, <laughs> they turn into a zombie. They can go from like a very intelligent person to, to like a complete idiot. The moment they see that, they're, they're just done. So like I got like the code tolerance, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that helps me. So I would say I got yeah, tolerance for like uh, intensive uh, tech driven stuff. Because art, I mean, we're, we're really pretty artful here in terms of traditional art and stuff like that. Yeah. But a willingness to experiment mess around with some of this code, try different things. Yeah, that was, yeah. That was the US thing, I say. I hear that, man. And, and so that's an interesting thing, uh, because that stint at like Cartoon Network, um, how long were you there for? That was about two years. 
Two years? Yeah. What does the work like what does the work look like there? This is like the kid in me who's just like mm. really fucking curious now. First of all, it was great. It was actually a good time. Like uh, my supervisor, Chris, was fantastic. He actually he taught me a lot. We worked on a team, like closely a team of about a dozen people on a weekly production, which was nice because it was sprints, you know. Yeah. And I've since worked on like longer stuff where you get like multiple rounds, but working on sprints was great because we got we learned how to do things fast. So if it's, if it's a sprint, is that like a tight deadline? Yeah. That's really you're producing a 21-minute like show a week. And it was a mix of like live action stuff, <laughs> motion tracking, some pure animated stuff, some, some recurring stuff week to week that you customize. Um, it was a good work environment. Everyone was like passionate about it. Um, I just think it was just a, a good team to be on both to learn the technical stuff as well as just to see how like a good supervisor like keeps things like together you know when yeah. someone needs to like you know take a week off or just like do something else let them do that because at the end of the day you want to sustain it over the course of the season and maybe beyond that you know yeah yeah so um, yeah i really liked it, it taught I me a lot it, learned a lot that sounds fantastic so is that experience what um what drew you to digital art? Because I know that now um, you make a lot of like VR stuff, AR stuff, um, just a lot of, even even uh, your art as well, is, a lot of it is, is digital art as well, right? Yeah. Like I'd say I do quite a bit of uh, AR stuff. I'm working on a VR project, but it takes a lot longer than AR. AR, I can knock out an AR thing like pretty quickly. Yeah. So I would say, was I into digital art before? A little bit, but not as much. I think working a, in a production house like that, you'll get much more into it because you need to be fast. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was part of what drew me into digital art, but I just like digital art as well. Like, it's all art to me. You know what I mean? Like, recently with the AI stuff, there's a certain point where it's not the same. It's not yeah. the same. <laughs> Generative art is not the same. Especially if you're not, uh, I've done generative art where I have to come up with the code, you know what I mean? And I feel like I'm making something, like coding it is making something. Yeah. I don't get that same sense of making from, type prompt. A, from typing a prompt. No, I just don't. It doesn't seem the same. I feel like the person who made it is the people who made the... Whatever it is you The get, actual right? AI yeah. engine. That's the making. Typing text is not the same as like writing 60 lines of code to generate this funky thing, which I... Which, gives me that sense of like making, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's nice that to you're see. creating. It's nice to see that you're making something. But some people just want the end result. They, they're not <laughs> interested in the process. But I think that's a, it's a bit of a trap because if it's super easy to do something, then this value goes right down. Yeah. So yeah. I think if you're an artist, you don't want what you do to be easily duplicated. And that it's made me also realize the value of uh, tactile stuff an actual canvas, you know, an actual object because that can't, that isn't purely digital. Because if it's something is purely digital, disbelieve the AI is going to figure out how to like simulate it. That's yeah. just, that's exactly. <laughs> like I've, I've gone down that rabbit hole. It's good. It's scarily good. It's, it's actually it's good. Yeah. So we have to, <laughs> we have to ask the hard questions about what is art to us? Like, uh, what is the value of an object? An, an object is a non-fungible token in a way. It's an NFT, yeah. you know what I mean? If it's done well enough, yeah, it's, uh, it's more non-fungible than you know some pixels on the screen, you know. So as much as I like it, AI has forced this debate a little bit. So I yeah, think it does force you to think. People have to I, think about it. I do, I do love what you mentioned there, right? About like um, things being too easy to make, and I think to some degree that's that's what like ruined like NFTs when people would make like generators, and yeah. one person like makes six hundred designs, and they're yeah. trying to sell each and every one, and you're like, bro. Like, you and, know and what it that? took you like five minutes and like... <laughs> I said economics, in economic terms, it's, we talk about scarcity here, right? <laughs> supply and demand. Part of what we like in art is that we, want, we look at it and we're like, wow, man, someone really put some effort, someone was really passionate about it, you know what I mean? Yeah. We don't look at it and be like, oh yeah, that looks like someone... That looks like one of 600. Uh, one of 6,000, <laughs> oh, oh, another monkey. I mean, ape, oh, it's a bored ape. Okay, this is yeah. it. No, no. Part of what makes it cool and interesting and valuable is that someone put a lot of effort 
train themselves to get the skill to do it. And the reward is actually creating something that's, that's like valuable and isn't so easily duplicated. Yeah. I love that, man. Um, and so do you think there's like a, a link between uh, traditional art and, 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 and digital art, like a link or a relationship? Oh yeah. Yeah, there is. There's, um, there's a huge range. And at the extremes, they seem very disconnected. Yeah. Because if you think about, let me give examples at the extremes. On one end, traditional art, you've got like, uh, let's say sculpture like clay sculpture. You're literally working with your hands, you're making something. Yeah. Sometimes you're even like going to find your own clay and your own dyes, you know, you're finding your own uh, your tools and supplies. Yeah. Very tactile, it's embodied, you know. And then on the far end, you have like, you know, prompt art, where you have no idea how this mid-journey works or how it's coded. You just have, you know, some texts and you realize how to like type the text in to generate what you want and you could literally have like no motor skills whatsoever yep <laughs> you know? so fully embodied fully te technologized but disembodied you know but then like the things that connect them now i started off drawing and painting sort of drawing actually and then a little bit of painting in high school now i've got a wacom tablet i draw I just got control net set up for my stable diffusion where I can like literally draw a stick figure and it will generate like uh, some output. But the better like my drawing is, whether it's like an interior or like figures posed, the better my output would be. Yeah. So there, there is a connection there. There is a different mindset and it needs to be acknowledged because I think people are saying art is art. So like, yeah, art is art, but they're not all the same. Like. Um, there's a meditative element, there's an artist's journey eh? where you're like working on your craft, you're developing what you're doing and you're practicing and you're getting the reward of like seeing yourself get better yeah, at what gradually you're doing. Gradually growing. Yeah. yeah. It's a um, it's slow cooked progression. Whereas we live in this super fast paced culture, you want it right now. Feedback all the time. Want it right now. <laughs> the, on the far end of the tech spectrum, it's not about, it's not driven by art or artists. It's driven by <laughs> these media platforms that want content. Yep. That's what it's driven by. It's not driven by this cultural demand for high velocity art. No, no. It's driven by these platforms that want traffic because they sell ads. So we need to acknowledge that. A similar metaphor would be like um, KFC doesn't sell that food because it's like the healthiest, most delicious food. It sells yeah. that because it's probably the fastest stuff they can cook and sell at a, at a good margin. But if you want to eat something delicious, I mean, yeah, KFC is nice once in a while, yeah. but it's not the healthiest thing for you. you <laughs> it's not know? like a sustainable thing, right? It's you not. can't eat it like every day for like 30 no, days. No, you can't. <laughs> it's called fast food. And then there's healthy food, you know. But they are, they are connected, but they're not the same. And at the extremes, they seem like completely alien to each other. Yeah. I've got a friend that hates this AI stuff, but he's going to have to learn some of it. Understandably, but I love what you said there, right? Like, some of it, I think, has to be learned. I think, I think yeah. there is like some utility there. There is, for sure, because there's some tedious stuff. Like I've worked, I've done some concept art where it's like literally, I looked at the files yesterday, I think we did 10 rounds, one image. Yeah. 10 rounds. <laughs> <laughs> so when I see stuff like that, I'm like, you know what? Maybe I, I can like yeah. speed this up. Super tedious stuff. Okay, AI is there. There's certain tasks like uh, that are just boring. They're not creative. Actually, they're just technical tasks like uh, keying out stuff, yeah. motion tracking stuff, um, subtitles, obviously, uh, narration. The first thing I noticed when I had stable diffusion was that I uh, I stopped doing Google image search. I just generated the images using stable diffusion. So there are definitely ways to use it, which I'm like 100% behind. Yeah. The issues with the whole training data set and like the copyright violations and that, that can be sorted out. You but think so? Yeah, I think it needs to be sorted out for it to be like an ethical thing. But as it is right now, I think they've, just been, they've just been like hoovering stuff. Yeah, they're just pulling everything. Yeah. They're pulling everything. <laughs> but uh, someone I know is actually in, in, involved in a class action lawsuit uh, an artist from Atlanta. Yeah. What's her name? Kelly McKernan. 
is one of the plaintiffs. So let's see. Let's see how it goes. They need to do it right. It's like when, when Napster came out, you know, people had to sue them. And then, well, Napster is no more, but now we actually yeah, have, have like, legitimate yeah. services where it's like, you know, it's consensual, people agree. Yeah. And it's not just, you know, the technologists being like, everything we can simulate belongs to us, which is a crude way of describing what they're saying right now. Yeah, so. it's, yeah, fair enough. I hear that, man. And so let's talk about, I think that uh, flows perfectly into um, Digital Futures Lab, right? Um, mm -hmm. I saw the call about, I think, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Interesting thing, man. Uh, what's going on with that? Uh, what's, what's the call? So, what's the thinking behind it? Yeah. So this is the second year. And the, the basic direction is to get fashion designers, technologists, creatives, and accessory designers. Teach them how to use augmented reality and virtual reality to tell stories and create these immersive I guess, projects around sustainability in fashion and accessory design. Yeah. So to make that simpler, let's say, for example, because I'm right now coming up with my part of the curriculum. The partners are Kurokoza Zim. There's a Twig, sustainable fashion in um, South Africa. Electric yeah. South, also based in Cape Town there, along with the uh, British Council. And what we're trying to do, we're going to take six Zimbabweans uh, three teams of two, yeah. along with six South Africans, and during the week we'll teach them. Trig will teach them about the sustainable practices around the fashion stuff, and myself and some others will teach about the technology itself, like uh, how do you create the virtual fashion show, how do you create uh, AR filters for body, face, plane tracking, yeah. how to create like a walk-in studio in AR, how to um, just that sort of stuff, like a mix of the technical side as well as some of the ideas around how do you make your craft more sustainable, better for the environment, recycling materials, that sort of thing. Yeah, I love that, man. Um, I love that. I, I really do. Uh, and so from, from the first one, did you do like a similar thing as well uh, or it was quite different like conceptually? Uh, the theme was similar. The things that are different this year are we're getting six Zimbabwean participants, which I'm quite proud of. Getting yeah, some, get some let's Zimbabwe go. Zimbabwe represent, <laughs> get them in there. And I also try to get people that are accessory designers in there as well. So it's not just, um, not just garment designers, but people that make accessories, whether it's hats, bags, shoes, that sort of thing, just to kind of open it up a little bit more. Yeah. So I think those are, yeah, those are only like minor tweaks. From last year. Right? From last year. I hear that, man. I love that. Um, I want to... This goes a bit, not left field, but it takes like a random turn, right? Because um, one of the things you said uh, that can happen to you on a good day is like a lucid dream. Uh, why mm -hmm. is that the case? Ah, oh, man, like a good dream kind of... It breaks up the monotony of like our habits, you know? I feel like we can get so into whatever is stressing us out, whatever is going on. But then if you have like a really lucid dream, firstly, it's a reminder of how, how broad experience can be, how the, there's a different world, there's a spiritual, there's a subconscious world yeah. that's going on. Uh, people tend to dream, well, me personally, I tend to dream when I'm like very alert and like dealing with new stimulus in my life. Uh, clear-headed, sleeping well, that's when I dream. So for me, it's usually a sign that I'm in good health, but also like stimulated, you know? Yeah. Like, if I go traveling somewhere, I'll dream a lot. Um, yeah, I think, uh, especially at, and if it's lucid, you're kind of in control of the dream, which is always yeah, fun. Yeah, those are like crazy. I know someone who studied lucid dreaming uh, product design, and uh, he became like a monk. <laughs> so, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, like a, he's a friend of a friend and he was working on lucid dream like literal like headbands with like yeah. flashing lights that would like help I guess stimulate the lucid dreaming state oh so they're trying to like induce yeah like, trying to induce it and like just do research on the whole thing and then uh, 
I don't know if he finished it or not. I'll ask my friend what happened. <laughs> he was cold. <laughs> but he, he ended up going like, like full on monk, eh? Like three months wow. silence, meditation in the woods and stuff. Ooh, three months, like no, no talking, yeah, like full on, full he's on. Like. Full on monk from the last I heard. So I think it, it's, a, it's a whole realm. I wouldn't recommend that because we. <laughs> Most of us aren't there for that monk life. Yeah, man, like that's... <laughs> yeah, I think dreams are good. It's a good thing to have dreams. Yeah, that's dope. That's, <laughs> that's a hilarious story, man. Yeah, man. That's a hilarious story. Um, and so, early on, you talked about uh, abstraction, like, within art, right? Like, multiple layers, having someone see something and be like, oh, yeah. shit, that's like a woman with a baby. And then they stand there for like five more minutes and then they realize there's this and that, there's that and that. They stand there for like an hour, there's something else. Um, I think I heard you, I don't know if I read this or I heard you say it in, in, in a separate video that you've used um, Braille in, in some of your art. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where did that idea come from, man? Like, <laughs> I don't know where to place it exactly, but it's been... It's been years. I think I've been putting it in and out like maybe over 15 years at this point. Yeah. I went online at some point and I saw that the Braille alphabet was literally you know, A to Z and each one has got its own little symbol and they're like, you know, two, two columns, three rows. That's the basic uh, scheme for it and then the dots configuration. Yeah. So in general though, I do love putting coded messages in there, whether it's like the, whatever's being illustrated or literal codes of like Braille, Bantu symbols. Like, yeah. um, I've done some research into those as well as the Adinkra symbol, which is more like West African. I love to put that sort of stuff in there. Yeah. That way, like, uh, if you know, and then someone will surprise me because they've, you know, they've, they've seen some of this stuff and they're like, oh, this, that, 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 I, that. I know like, that. That's just like nice. It's like, a, it's like an Easter egg sort of thing. Yeah, you know? exactly, exactly. And um, I think once people know that this stuff is in there, people start to like dig and then it makes people more curious about like, you know, how do you learn Braille? It's pretty straightforward. You can learn it. And you can also decode it with like a, like a, like a cheat sheet in front of you. And yeah. More yeah. curious about these different African symbol libraries that we have. Like, uh, I, I just like that stuff. I like symbolism. Yeah. But I like symbolism that's got you know, something to do with me, which is why I like the Bantu stuff. And since I'm, it's kind of ironic because I'm very, I'm like a visual artist. So I think there's something cool about Braille. And in the gallery, you, you're often not allowed to touch the art. That's, so yeah, something that's I'm awesome. working on is completely <laughs> about touch, actually. But like imagine Braille, but instead of like tiny, it's like you gotta like touch like that. Yeah. That's like a couple of pieces I'm trying to work on right now. I love to hear that, man. I, and, and so, how, how, how often do people like figure it out? <laughs> and tell me about it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> At least and, and tell you about it. Man. Once a while, like yeah. maybe, maybe like two or three times a year, someone yeah. would be like, oh, you wrote this thing in there. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know? Sometimes I just write straight up words as well, you know? So I'm interested in language. Language is huge. Just um, whether it's like symbols, but just straight up the way propaganda and language is used to kind of control people, confuse yeah. people. A lot of it is just noise as well. A lot of stuff a lot that's of out media there now is literally just crowd out the, the relevant stuff with irrelevant stuff. Yeah, most of it, I think. Maybe, maybe that's me being harsh, but I definitely feel like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. Like, if you, if you start thinking about what's serious and how to, like, improve people's lives, a lot of people would be better off if they were off the internet completely. Yeah. Because a lot of it isn't that relevant to, like, you know, your day-to-day -day stuff, you know. Most of us don't need that much politics. Maybe if we needed, like, maybe the month leading up to, like, an election or something, but I know yeah. people that get super worked up and it's just like, Ish. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then what, right? It's... And then what? It... That's the sad thing. <laughs> the more you get into it, the more, the more disempowered you can feel because like you can actually find out like a lot of stuff, but then unless you're, you know, in the holes where you can do something about it, it's just a very like disempowering yeah. sensation. So you're better off. And disengaging sometimes. Disengage, focus on what you can actually control, which is your own stuff. 
But, yeah. Yeah. For massive me, believer in that as well, to be fair. Yeah. I think um, it's important. Massive believer in that. And so that's nice because uh, it makes me, it, it, it reminds me of something that I actually hadn't scripted, right? Which is um, uh, the last exhibition of yours I saw uh, was at uh, Zika, um, the H Metro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I absolutely love that. <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> Um, quite funny, quite provocative. Um, what was what was the goal with that? Was there a goal with that? Like, what, what was mm. going on? Yeah, there was some goal. Like, I started doing H Metro. I think early in this whole COVID lockdown saga. Yeah, and. It's a satire of obviously the H Metro headlines, which is like a ridiculous tabloid, right? Yep. <laughs> but then I, I started using it as a vehicle to kind of to vent my frustration at all like the fake propaganda, the manipulation, and all the word games and just like, the blatant lying. Um, a lot of propaganda is just literally saying the lie a thousand times, and Until, enough people yeah, yeah. will start to repeat it. And you see it working. That's the most distressing thing is people start to. It works like all the time. Yeah. And then people start to, people in your own DMs will start to regurgitate the propaganda. Then it's like, you know what? The best way I can prompt people to think about this and analyze what they're like ingesting yeah. is through satire. It's the best way and it's also the only safe way. Because if you're like too, yeah. if you're too blunt, <laughs> people get too touched. But there's something about like making like satire where people kind of have to. Everyone wants to get the joke. Yeah, it's a bit impersonal, isn't it? Yeah. Like people disassociate. Well, like, yeah. what, what can we not make fun of at this point? You know, if, some, if someone says something is too sacred, then it's almost like, what, what's actually going on there? So I, I like satire. And, gets, and H. Metro is a good way for me to play with the words, the propaganda, to like... In, it's almost... Words end up becoming almost like, uh, like, like puzzle pieces. Yeah. Because I've done maybe... 130 of those in total now and the words become like yeah they become after a while i started to see how the structure of like satire is how you can like completely subvert something by just you know rearranging things or say the quiet part out loud or take it to like a nearby context that's always ignored because it's not appropriate but it's like right next to it yeah just little things like that and you realize how much of a house of cards a lot of this stuff is, you know? Yeah. It doesn't, it can't stand up to, uh, to satire. One of the things you said is that um, you view mistakes like during the process of creation as like happy accidents, right? Um, and that's something like, I think only creators and maybe sometimes business people can like fully understand. Um, mm -hmm. Why is that the approach you take, right? Uh, instead of perfectionism, because there are a lot of people who are like so obsessed with like yeah. getting everything right, like to the point where they can't start, right? Because starting means you're an amateur and, and all that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm one of those people too. Like, uh, I had to like consciously be like, you know what? Because when I was more fixated on just painting, you're basically trying to make it as good a painting as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, which is a, it's a complete trap. It's a weird thing as it's well. A, it's like, a total what's a, trap. What's a good painting? <laughs> I mean, I like to see some skill and craft. I'm not into this whole jazz hands, hey, it looks like it was painted by some drunk guy on crack. I, I'm not <laughs> into that. I'm sorry. It doesn't impress me. Some people yeah. go like, ooh la la. It's usually the, the stiffest people that are the most moved by like the jazz hand stuff. Yeah. But for me, I understand the impulse to want to be good at your craft, right? but you'll never be perfect, no one's perfect. So when I talk about happy mistakes, it's just this idea of like uh, working in such a way that your own idiosyncratic little habits, that ends up being your style, really. That, that's what separates you from like a photograph of this, this scene. Yeah. It's, now it's your painting, right? This whole the happy mistakes thing is very much like a painting thing. It doesn't, it can happen with the more digital stuff, but it's because it's technical, you do yeah. need a bit and you more can, control. Yeah, and you can always erase the happy mistakes with, yeah, with you can undo digital. It. <laughs> but from learning that lesson with the painting, the fact that you want to have 
some looseness and like listen to your own little things. Yeah. You can you can weave that into your digital craft. Like for example, you can work with performance. You know, where nothing is perfect. It's always going to be a, an element of just human error or you know someone blinking or do something, something yeah. weird. You know, <laughs> so give it an opportunity for like the human to come into it instead of like this super mechanical, technical, let's get it perfect sort of thing. And work in series. Like uh, I had a good friend who really showed me the the, the benefits of working in series because it takes the pressure off. If you're working on like one, let's say like one painting, right, and you're like obsessed about it, you're like oh, it's gotta be perfect. It's like you're much better off working on like ten simultaneously. Yeah. And in the back of your mind, understanding that maybe three of these aren't gonna make it. You know. Yeah, fair enough. Because it shows, you can see the anxiety in like a stiff, uh, in a stiff drawing or like a stiff painting. You can see like someone's like, if they're tensing too much. But if you work in, on a batch, it's easier, you get looser. You can just hop from one to the other, come back when things are firing. Yeah. I hear that, man. Um, that makes me think of something which might be like an unfair question. But uh, how many like paintings do you paint like on maybe like a monthly basis? Mm. Some, some months, none. Some months could be, at most, I think the most I've ever done in a month is probably about, like finished like 10. Yeah. But some months it's zero. So, like, uh, if I have, like this show that I have coming up, it's, it's basically mixing up all these different media. Painting, this like tufting stuff, as yeah. well as some digital like uh, AR stuff. And for that, there's a lot of painting involved right now. And then I think towards the end, it's just gonna be finishing the digital aspects of it. Yeah. So it very much depends on what's going on. Like if I didn't have a show coming up, I don't think I'd be painting that much. I'd probably just be sketching for my own, you know, practice and whatnot. But when I, once I have a show, I start painting more. And but on a typical month with like no show going on, I tend to lean more into digital because it's more shareable and it translates into more client work. Like direct, like, you know, oh, you did this thing. Can you do this uh, animated ad for us? Can you do like yeah. this video thing, some titles for this and that? So I paint more when I have a show coming up because that's, that's the only venue for the paintings, you know? It's it not, makes uh, sense. It's not corporate. It makes sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, um, You've also said your favorite painting is always your next one. So you don't have like a baby where you're like, man, I like, this is nah, like, nah. thus far, this is. I've got, I've got paintings that I've done that I liked, but I want to always like be looking forward to the next one because at no point when I was doing those paintings, I wasn't like, oh, this is the best thing ever. It's yeah. only like in hindsight <laughs> where it's just like, you know, and I've done paintings where I thought it was like trash and other people liked it. I was like, hey, okay, mm -hmm. people are different. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think it's, it's just a good way to like, to stay, to stay motivated and excited is to kind of, uh, to, to think the next one will be like the best one, you know? And yeah. that's the way. But I don't think there is a best. I think it's mostly about like a body of work. Other people will decide what they like more, but for me, I think because it started from such a, it's like a simple childish perspective, literally just hanging out, chilling at peace. I want it to be like a practice rather than you know, trying to get like that trophy piece, like, hey, yeah. look at that. I mean, that's cool at all, but uh, yeah, Not it's a lifelong thing. Yeah. Nah, so I, wanted, uh, I would be painting even if I wasn't making any money from it, you know? I would be doing art, should I say, even if I wasn't making any money from it. But I need to make money from it in order to do it, in order to like have more time to do it, should I say? Yeah. Because. If I don't make any money from it, I'm going to have to do other stuff. That's going to eat yeah, up more that of my time. your time. So it's this whole like, you know, professional, personal <laughs> practice balance that you got to keep going. And it seems to be going okay right now. Last year was decent and I think this year will be even better. So I'd love to hear that, man. Love to hear that. And then uh, the last thing I'll ask you, um, why is the best idea to do the work instead of the idea itself? In my experience, the best ideas come when I'm doing the work. Like um, once I'm actually in the trenches, once I'm hands-on, whether it's coding and I'm seeing like how 
the uninformed idea translates into reality, that's when the real good idea comes out for me. Like once I actually have the paint on the canvas or I have the tool, the tufting gun in my hand, or I've made like a draft of something and I'm like, hold on a second, we could do it like this. Yeah. Whereas sometimes you have a great idea, but it's not informed by the reality of like the medium, you know? So I feel yeah. like yeah, the best yeah. ideas come when you're like in there and you're like, hold on a second. <laughs> what if we do it like that? But you're not going to think that way until yeah, you're like until hands you on with it, yeah. you know, then you see what's, okay, this is the reality of it. So. Ooh, I love that. Actually, one more thing. Um, tafting, man. Uh, how did you get into that? Um, Oof. I was looking it up and um, about 10 months ago, at the time, I just finished doing a lot of like concept art, like literally like rounds and rounds of revisions, of digital drawing, a lot of Photoshop stuff, a lot of Zoom calls. Good work, but I was a bit, not burnt out, but I wanted to do something that wasn't digital at all. Yeah. And my first, my habit would have been, oh, go paint. But I was like, nah, I actually don't want to paint at all. I want to do something else. Like totally different. <laughs> that I saw like on my Instagram feed, it was like, um, I just saw like some bright colors that had like texture. And I was like, is that yarn? I was like, what is that? <laughs> and then, you know, and I was like, okay, hit like, like save this to the collection. Then I started seeing more and more of it. And then my, um, my brother-in-law was uh, coming to visit from the UK and I was like, wow, let me see if I can get the gear for this and give it a shot. Literally got the tufting gun, found out where I could get the yarn. I got a <laughs> yarn bun with the yeah. grandmas in, in, in Chizzy, the literal, literal grandmas. Yeah. Yeah. The, my first time in there, the lady was like following me around the shop. <laughs> then wondering was, like, what this guy is like, yeah, she's like, for she's like, I think you're the first man I've had in the shop in years because it's like Google is going there for like knitting for crochet stuff, you know? Yeah, and <laughs> you're like a fucking unicorn. This is awesome. It's fantastic. It's, uh, it's very hands-on. There's no control Z. There's no undo button. It's, you're, you're literally putting yarn through um, some fabric. So it's kind of, I like the directness of it. I like the bright colors, the type yeah. of color you can get. And in a weird way, it's like, uh, it can, it's, a, it's a similar visual language to my more like color block painting stuff. But because of the nature of yarn, it's just like, you know, like what you'd have to do, like maybe four layers of the same color to get that like pop yeah. with, with yarn. It's just like, brrr, like literally, and, brrr, it's, and it's like then it's got <laughs> thickness and you can like shave it off and it, it invites the touch as well. Because it's just yarn. There's something about it you want to like touch. You want to rub it. Yeah, it's like fur, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, so yeah, there's just everything. I love everything about the material. Like uh, even the throwaway yarn when I'm like done with the piece and I try to clean it up. Even that stuff is cool. So I'm even making stuff out of that as well. It's just um, perfect timing for me. I just I, just, I was looking for something non-digital, and yeah. non-painting, and, and this that. was just like this will work. So love that. I love I that. I lucked up. Um, 